We're here with Soledad O'Brien, uh, a three-time Emmy award-winning anchor and reporter, and today a producer for CNN, MSNBC, NBC, and currently an entrepreneur as CEO of Starfish Media Group. Soledad, your work and your honors include Black in America, Latino in America for CNN, the Haiti earthquake. I like that you're going on and on and on, but I think you're just saying that I'm old and I've been in the business a long time. Hurricane Katrina and the BP Gulf Coast oil spill. And you produce the program, Matter of Fact, with Soledad O'Brien and a reporter for Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. Yeah, and, and a bunch of docu-series and documentaries as well. And, um, and our company does a fair amount of branded content as well. What do you do with all your spare time? Right, obviously, I sit around and drink pina coladas, eat peeled grapes. When you first got into the business, they wanted you to change your name. My first boss was a woman named Jean Bollocky, who for, was from um, Minnesota, and she changed her name to Jean Blake which was a nice generic -y TV anchor name. And yeah, I had been asked by somebody, you know, would you be willing to change your name? And um, because they thought Soledad, and it was so weird. It was like, we think Soledad will be too hard to pronounce, which is like. The other piece about your story, you dropped out of Harvard in order to take that job. I had been pre-med, uh, English major and pre-med, and I just wasn't really convinced I wanted to go to medical school. And actually my medical background was really helpful because of course it was in the 80s and HIV AIDS was a huge story. So it ended up being really helpful that I had a very solid foundation in science and medicine. You went to San Francisco where you were a reporter with KRON, Cron. Yes, mm -hmm. Did the opiate addiction uh, syndrome start at that time. Meth was a huge deal in San Francisco at that time and meth labs actually catching fire. So often what you're covering were house fires and it would turn out in some big, um, in some big housing complex, someone would set their apartment on fire because they were actually, um, you know, cooking meth. I love being able to sort of ferret out what was the story? How do you cover it? How do you get access to it? So it was exciting, it was great. And I didn't think like, oh, I'm scared, it's meth labs. It was like, oh my God, this is amazing. In the past, sometimes journalism, and I would say presidents too, as in fireside chats, tried to address people's fears and really bring people over the line. Are we not doing that? The way news organizations are telling stories, it's much faster, much more sped up. It's um, a faster news cycle. It's a much shorter attention span. Uh, I don't see a lot of people saying, so we're covering the story and we thought we'd sit down and tell you, why did we pick this story? And, and how do we think about framing it? You know, there's five different ways you could look at it. We decided to do this and here's why. Well, no one ever does that, ever. We don't explain any of stories. We jump in, we try to keep the sound bites super short. No more than eight seconds, because maybe we're going to lose the audience. Move it along, move it along, uh, and then move off of it. Guess what? We won't be revisiting this important story again <laughs> anytime soon. Wouldn't that explain why when you go to a movie today, so many more movies are based on truth? I think people do want context. And again, you know, we're at a time where I feel like there's a fire hose of information that comes into my head every single morning. I wake up and... <sighs> tons of information, even in the reporting that we do for Matter of Fact and, and others, we're constantly giving people context. So we just did a piece last weekend that aired that looks at can you improve a neighborhood and not necessarily gentrify it? Like, could you improve it and have the people who live there actually live in just a better neighborhood? Um, increase the footprint, have people come in certainly, but that you don't have to kick people out for the neighborhood to get better. And so, you know, in order to do that story, you actually have to back up and explain that in the 60s in West Louisville, Kentucky, there was urban renewal, which was really tearing down a lot of the African-American businesses. So people are very resistant to something called urban renewal because in many cases, they, all the black business owners lost their business, which basically decimated parts of West Louisville. For me, I, I think context is, is everything. You must be a terribly organized person. <laughs> yes. Why, yes, I am, Jeff. Thank you for asking. No, not, not, um, I'm not terribly disorganized, but I wouldn't, nobody who knows me would say I'm super organized. I'm organized about some things. I really know how to organize my life in ways that are effective for me. I know when I'm best in the morning, so I structure my day around that. 
I know my weaknesses, so I structure my team around that. I know how to get by on very little sleep, so I make sure that I can have a day when I'm super busy and running around and shooting and then come back and after another day I need some sleep. So I think I've sort of just figured out the best ways to be effective and maybe that reads as being organized, but I really think it's just kind of knowing your weaknesses. Your mind is like a laundry list? My list. laundry list, which is on my desk, is like a laundry list. I no longer leave it in my head because I can't, I can't remember anything. My, and I've never, I tried meditating, but I end up sort of being like, um, um, oh crap, I gotta get eggs. Okay, oh, eggs and milk. Oh, and cheese, I gotta get cheese for that. You know, and by the five minutes into my meditation, I'm like, Eggs, milk, cheese, like mnemonic devices. To try. I know that you're a great list maker because you've made a lot of great lists. You're a People Magazine's most beautiful list, of course. You're on Harvard's graduates list because you went back and finished your degree. Yep. And by the way, for people who don't know, it's no big deal in the O'Brien family since your five siblings also went to Harvard. Harvard is incredibly hard to get into. And you're there with geniuses. You're there with people who think they're geniuses, if I may correct you. And it is a brand. And it is hard to get into, especially now. But when I was there, it was, it was definitely, you know, it was, you had to be academically very strong and certainly a student who had a lot of interests. Um, but it wasn't impossible. I really always bristle against the reverence of Harvard. There's a million good schools. Um, lots and lots of good colleges and a Harvard student is no more special. This is going to be devastating to some people who went to Harvard. No more special than any other student anywhere. And there's actually a lot of studies that show that. Like more people who are CEOs went to state schools. Harvard people don't do better in life. So, I mean, only in their own minds. And I dated some of those people who really thought in their own minds. They were like, amazing. Any names you want to share with us? They know who they are. They know who they are, let me tell you. The other list I referred to, you've been profiled in uh, Hispanic Magazine, mm -hmm. in Essence Magazine in the 40 Under 40, but you're also one of the top 100 Irish Americans. Yep. I would say you're the only person who could make those three <laughs> lists. And I think that's the, you know, that's the multicultural American today. My mom is Afro-Cuban. My dad is Australian. His family's through Scotland and Ireland. Uh, all of the above, like if you're Cuban, you are Cuban. If you're Irish, you are Irish. So I love it. I think it's great. And, and I've always been really, you know, excited to talk about it. Someone did ask me if I was Czechoslovakian once. I was like, well, that's a new one. And your name, certainly sounds very Irish, but you did experience some form of racism when you were growing up and you mentioned it to your mother and here was her advice. She said, Soledad, you're a light skinned black with freckles. You owe it to yourself to figure out who you are, but you don't owe it to anyone else to defend it. Yeah, you know what's so funny? I had no idea what she was talking about when she said that. My mother, I thought she was insane because she used to say all the time, like, don't let anybody tell you you're not black and don't let anybody tell you're not Latina. And I'm like, that's not actually what's happening. <laughs> like, it's kind of the opposite. But when we did Black in America, the documentary series, so I was probably 40, maybe 41 or something, and people would say, well, I mean, you're not really black and you're doing this stuff. And I was like, oh, this is what she was talking about. Like this, everybody gets to weigh in on whether or not you're the right person to be covering the story because of how they think they see you. And so I was really happy that she had had that conversation with me because really I didn't understand it at the time. And then later I was old enough to literally not give a crap about what anybody thought. I mean, 40 or like, I don't care. Uh, and so it was very freeing. I think she really understood it. You know, my mom married my dad, who's white, when uh, in the 1950s. So I'm sure she had a lot of practice of just tuning out the feedback, even from people close to you. And I think that's what she was trying to say. It was like, you know, you don't have to make anybody else comfortable with your choices, with how you want to identify. Don't feel like you need to make other people comfortable. And I think I've really uh, fully embrace that. I don't worry so much about making people comfortable. I just don't care. And now that I'm 50 something, it's, it's even better. I do not give a shit at all. I think that comes through. <laughs> In your book, The Next Big Story, you referred to an incident that you had 
with Jesse Jackson. He leaned over and he kind of like grabbed my skin and was like, you know, you don't count. And he said to me that he thought like, well, I didn't really realize that you're black. I thought he, he had a sense that Afro-Cubans or Caribbean people were different than American black people. And, you know, uh, listen, he's the forefront of the civil rights movement. I certainly understand that he has a perspective on that that might be different than my perspective. Um, I don't think that's a, a particularly modern way of, of looking at things. And I think it's silly to parse it that way. Um, it was weird. It was just weird. Like, who says that? You received a call one morning, and I guess it was from some military headquarters. It might have been from Iraq. What went through your head when the reality hit you? It was so weird, because someone said, can you hold for Bill Wheatley? And he said, David's dead. David who, Bloom, your co-anchor on Weekend Today. It was the middle of the night, and I just remember being completely perplexed about, like, you know, but then, of course, you're wide awake. And phone calls at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning are always terrible news. They're never good news. There's never a phone call that I've gotten at that hour that was like, hey, I won the lottery. It's always bad news. And so, yeah, I went in. Matt Lauer was um, going to anchor the show. Uh, uh, David had been in Iraq reporting. So I'd been doing crosstalk with him over the last few days. Uh, it was a shock. I mean, it was terrible because everybody, I don't know if you've ever been in the studio, um, but it's pretty big. And just, just all the, the floor people and the directors and the photographers and the sound, I mean, it was just everybody was just crying. All you could hear was weeping. I mean, it was terrible. It was terrible. It was terrible. What went through your head? I think for me, it was just getting through the morning because it was so upsetting and so one of the things that I was trying to do was to do a good job for his wife, Melanie, who I knew, and, and his daughters, who would come to visit the show a lot, you know, and I was always like, Dad says you can't have ice cream, I'll take you for ice cream. Um, you know, and so you try to, to hold it together and do a good job. Tell us a little bit about going to areas of devastation, and as a reporter, how do you feel about it, and then how does that affect you personally? I think, in a way, as a reporter, your goal is to kind of stay out of the way and make sure you're just doing a good job. Certainly Katrina, um, it was just crazy. You know, we lived on Canal Street in an RV and I had remembered running out the door to go cover Katrina um, to grab, I, my kids were so little, I grabbed the, 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 um, the refill bag of wipes, baby wipes. And it was the greatest thing ever because we would dole them out one at a time because we, you know, you just had no way to stay clean. I mean, you were disgusting. The entire, there's no place to shower, there's no clean water. I mean, there's, you know, kind of got food wherever you could. So, um, you know, and anytime I think you cover a disaster, the goal is to really make sure you stay on track with what you're there to do and not kind of, kind of go off on the tangent of, I'm uncomfortable, I'm tired, I'm crabby, this is happening to me. And it's not hard to do. You know, there can be a day where you just start kind of losing your mind a little bit. Um, same thing with the Haiti earthquake. Uh, I really, that was a story that I was very happy to cover. We pushed very hard to get CNN to do a lot of coverage from there. And we'll go back to Puerto Rico to talk about the aftermath of Maria. Uh, obviously, Lin-Manuel, who's wrapping up uh, Hamilton in Puerto Rico right now, has just done a great job of, of leading in terms of bringing attention to the island. Tragedy still brings us together, doesn't it? You know, I think what tragedy does is it it makes people see links that they hadn't seen before, right? So all of a sudden, if something happens in your neighborhood, someone who two weeks ago you thought was a jerk and played his music too loud and had too many parties, suddenly that's someone you have this shared experience with and now you're com compatriots um, trying to deal with this new issue. So I think it just makes these, these links that didn't exist before. You interviewed Suge Knight with Ice T. Yep from prison, and he informed you that he thought Tupac was still alive. He says a lot of things about Tupac. This was a special that we did uh, that looked at the killings of Biggie and Tupac over the years, you know, 20 some odd years later. And, um, and yeah, he says a lot of stuff. Actually, Suge was a very interesting interview. He's very entertaining. Um, and he certainly has his theories about what went down uh, in both of those instances and who was responsible for what. And um, whether he's in person or behind bars, he was not hesitant to talk about what he thought. I wanted to ask you about the Me Too movement mm -hmm. 
And since you worked with Matt Lauer, and he's been somewhat at the center or one of the people at the center of that movement, why did it seem to occur so much in the television industry? I think it occurs everywhere. I think when you're talking about people on TV, they just get more, they're more famous, more notoriety, but I guarantee you it happens in law firms and we know it happens in hospitals and in banks. And I've interviewed women who were, who were um, maids in hotels. So we'll talk about being sexually harassed by the, the people who are staying in the hotel in the most awful stories, I, to the point where I was like, I am not, this is not my first rodeo and I, you could knock me over with a feather. So I think it happens everywhere. I worked with Matt, uh, we both, I mean, he obviously was on the Today Show and I was on the Weekend Today Show. And I think a lot of people really liked Matt and respected him and uh, nobody was more surprised than me. I had no idea. We really need to figure out how we think about how we treat women in the workplace. For everybody, full stop. I mean, the stories are everywhere. I'm hopeful that the Me Too movement has made, certainly what it's done is it's made people recognize, like your bottom line is at risk if you do not ferret out these problems. It's no longer laugh and well that's so and so and it doesn't matter, that will come back and bite you. Uh, I think for corporations have recognized that and have really put in some, some strict rules. And I think it's also opened up conversations about well what is appropriate in, in the workplace. I did a, a, a panel with, um, for the New York Times Magazine with a bunch of other women, you know, even we were all not in agreement. You know, they said, so should the rule be you shouldn't kiss everybody? Well, I was like, well, I walked in and kissed everybody when I came in, because I know most of the women and we've known each other for a long time. Should you not date at work? Well, two of the women said, well, I, I married my husband when we dated at work. You know, so I think we're trying to find the vocabulary for these conversations and we're trying to figure out, well, what are the, what are the rules exactly? Is someone hugging you inappropriate? Is someone asking you out 18 times after you've said no every single time inappropriate? And where's the line on that? And, and obviously on some of the far end, certain things are just illegal, right? Attacking people, raping people, assaulting people for sure. But there's a lot of other things that are just, nobody knows exactly how to talk about them. So I think it's a net plus because we're trying to figure that out. And I don't think we've had these conversations before. Social media has changed the kind of conversation the journalists are having. Uh, and in the case of the president, how does a journalist approach politics in an age of Trump? The president has a big audience and he's gonna tweet. So I think the way you don't handle it is to chase the president's tweets where they go because you'll literally you know, run around chasing your tail all day. And we've seen that. And I think a lot of media hasn't quite figured that out, right? You can be working on a story and then all of a sudden, oh, but he's tweeted and everybody runs. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about Matter of Fact was that because we're a pre-taped show, we, we don't, we're not live. So we never, ever, ever will have a show where I say, good morning, everybody. The president has just tweeted this, ever. Thank God, I'm so happy about that because we're never, we're going to stick to the kinds of stories that we think are important stories and not be dragged off of those stories because some crazy ass thing the President of the United States has just tweeted. Recently, Tom Brokaw sent out a series of tweets where he was making reference to ethnic color. Well, he was on Meet the Press and he was talking about people that he interviewed who would sometimes, he said, when I push them, they'll say, I, I, I don't, not sure I wanna have brown grandbabies. And I think, um, which is, he's telling us that this is what people have told him. Um, for me as a reporter, that would be the start of my interview. If someone said that to me, I'd be like, well, wow, let me pull up my chair. That's an interesting thing to say. What do you mean you're not sure you want to have brown? Because that sounds kind of racist to me. Why don't you want to have brown? You know, so uh, you can't tell from his comments on Meet the Press. I think the other part of what he said uh, and I was tweeting about it this morning, is he said that, you know, he felt that Hispanics had to um, assimilate. You know, part of the problem in, uh, that, and that, that, in fact, that Hispanics had to make sure that their children were learning English. He's, the data would show that when people come to this country, often they don't speak English. The next generation, overwhelmingly, they speak a lot of English or they're bilingual. And by the second generation who's in the United States, the big problem is they don't speak Spanish anymore, right? So actually, I think it's something like 90 some odd percent, right? So you're kind of like, you're actually just wrong. 
The data does not support what you're saying. The data does not support that Hispanics don't assimilate at all. Hey, Cuban American assimilated person whose Spanish sucks, frankly, and I'm embarrassed, and my kids speak Spanish better than I do because the next generation says, oh my God, we've lost connection with our grandparents' roots, so now I'm gonna send you to school and make sure you learn that language that you should have learned. So I just think he was wrong on that part of his comment. And maybe he feels like Hispanics that he has known uh, have not assimilated. But the data overwhelmingly says that he's wrong. So he's talking about his own experience. And I wished that he had said, when someone says something to me like brown grandbabies, then what did you say? What was your follow-up question? Since you've become an entrepreneur, started your own business, what led you down this path and what was the biggest surprise? I use the expression entrepreneur, the first thing they realize is, oh, you mean someone actually has to make the coffee? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so the garbage cans don't empty themselves, what? Actually, when you're a mom, you also recognize that. So there's a lot of overlap between being a mom of four kids and being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, I really knew that I wanted to just cover the stuff that I wanted to cover. And I think that's what made me become an entrepreneur. What surprised me was um, how hard it is to build a team, how hard it is to really, you know, because sometimes you just don't have expertise and you have to hire people for an area that you're not expert in. I have to hire an editor. I don't really know enough about editing to be able to do a good job. So figuring out the strategy around how do you get a really good team of people. And, and again, back to where we kind of started, which is, understanding your own weaknesses so that you can make sure you're not doing a bad job hiring because of your own weaknesses. So I pretty quickly got a good team of people around me who would help me hire, right? Who would say, mm -hmm. like my husband's a great, a great person to help, right? Because he's like, I know nothing about editing, but I'll sit down and interview that person and say, you know, do you know that they want to go back to graduate school in eight months? Is this someone you want to hire? You know, just, just having different kinds of people in on the conversation I found very helpful. It's all about building teams. It's all about making sure that you're um, focused on the things that are important to you. It's very easy to spin your wheels and do a million things, and you really have to say no to a lot. I think for me, the first couple of years, we're figuring out, I said a yes to a lot because I was so panicked, like, <gasps> I've got to, you know, got to get this business going. And then really it comes down to just saying no to a lot. Like, what do I really want to do? What, what's really worth my time? And, um, and I think that's been very exciting. I mean, it turned out that I was good at negotiating, which I never would have thought. I mean, I, I really have been a reporter for a long time. I like structuring deals. I like negotiating with people. I'm really good at it. Uh, and it's exciting to find something that you're good at that's a little bit different than the thing yet you thought you were good at. So it's, it's, I've really enjoyed it. I really like being an entrepreneur and I like that every minute of the day I'm doing something that I decided that I wanted to do. Not, oh, this is just the way we do it here. We just kind of do this, you know. There's no, in this office, there is, people don't come in for FaceTime. You know, I do not want anybody who has to feel like Soledad needs to see me committed to my job ever. If you're sick, don't come in. If you've got good ideas, let's go figure out how to get them funded and make them happen. And I try to hire really smart people and then just set them free to do what they want to do. Was it difficult for you to have discussions with people about some of the details that come into the work life, whether it's compensation or they have problems at home and suddenly you're dealing with these things as an employer? I, I don't, I was never a great manager. I'd never been trained as a manager. Um, it's never difficult because I, I think I'm a very straightforward person. It's actually what I think I like about negotiating. Some people love to like go back and forth and back and forth and it's a game for them and they need to win. I'm like, here's what I want to achieve. Here's what I'm willing to pay for. It. This is what I want to do. Do you want to be part of this? And sometimes the answer is no. Like, listen, we're not going to see eye to eye. Best wishes to you and maybe the next go around, we're both going to be able to, you know, hit the things that we need in order to move forward. So I always think of negotiating as just, what do you need? Here's what I need. Let's save each other three and a half weeks of bullshitting and just lay out what we need. And we can get this deal done by the end of the week. But some people love to play the game of, I said this, but I really mean this, but they'll come back to this, which means we'll go to this. That's just not, that's not me. When people meet you for the first time, perhaps in an interview, you're a celebrity, you're famous. How do you get them to realize 
that you're a person, you're a boss, you're a colleague. How do you get them off the so with that O'Brien, which they've told all their friends that that's who they're meeting? First of all, here in New York City, I'm not, I'm, I'm on TV, but I don't think I'm famous. Like Madonna's famous, right? Beyonce's famous. I'm someone who's on TV. So people are more like, oh my God. And they'll say, I love that story. Or sometimes I hated that story. And they feel very comfortable <laughs> telling you what they think. Um, in interviews, I think the onus is on the interviewer to make the other person comfortable. And I think once everybody, especially if they haven't been interviewed before, where the cameras are a little distracting and the people are a little distracting, you know, it was my job to be like, ignore all of them. <laughs> once we start, you're not even gonna remember this and we're just gonna have a conversation. And I think that's just really engaging people and really listening, which at the end of the day is what a good interview is all about. In your book, you refer often to your upbringing and you talk about the Sunday morning donut routine, for instance. But there was a lot of love and a lot of closeness. Do you bring that to the workplace and how, does that, how, how has that changed you as an entrepreneur? My parents who were not entrepreneurs, although they were very straightforward and really kind of strict, I don't think of myself as strict, certainly not with my employees. I think I'm just clear. I really feel like this is what I need. You know, here's what my expectations are. This is what I need and, you know, and I, I think I try to do the way I like to be treated. I want to know what you know, what the milestones are and what the deliverables are and what the timeline is and, and what's working and stop me if I'm screwing this up and tell me what I'm doing wrong. I always just appreciated bosses who were like, here's what I need. Uh, and I didn't like bosses who played games and TV news is full of lots of people who play crazy games where you're like, are you happy today? Are you not happy today? How are we feeling? Who wants to waste everybody's time? I like to come in in a good mood. I like the workplace to be a really pleasant place. I never enjoyed going into offices where someone was like psycho mad and then everybody had to walk around on you know potato chips to make sure that, you know, like who wants that? I like the office to be fun. I hired nice people. I fire people who are not nice and make other people's experiences negative. And we move forward and get on, you know, so we can focus on the creative part and the business part of it and never the, you know, if it's just too much drama, I just, that's exhausting. I have four kids, right? It's like, at some point you're like, let's end with the drama and let's focus on the fun part. Is part of that keeping it simple? I think it's clear, right? To me, everything has to be, and I've learned a lot, right? Where you just expel out your expectations. Um, you know, I, I start my work day really early. Go to yoga first thing in the morning and I'm usually in the office, if I'm in town, eight o'clock. Right, so I'm here at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, other people want to come in at 10 o'clock. Some people, it's better for them if they come in at 11 because it just makes more sense. Just get your work done, right? Everybody just have to deliver what you need to deliver. You're a grown person. Deliver what you need to deliver. And I think if you sort of trust people to do their jobs well, some days, by the way, we're all in on a Saturday because we have a project with a deadline. Other days, we're like, woo! Looks like we're leaving at three o'clock, everybody, because <laughs> we're done. I've had a, employees who felt like, I just want you to know I'll be running 10 minutes late. I'm like, you're a grown up. I assume you're going to come in as soon as you possibly can. You don't need to tell me that the train is late today, unless we have a shoot, right? <laughs> then thanks for telling me. But like, if the train is late, I'm assuming you'll come in as soon as you can and you'll leave when your work is done. And if it's not done, you'll come in on Saturday and get it done. And if you are done, you might skip out early so you can go to your kid's recital. And none of that needs to be run by me because you're a grown up. I just think it's how I want it to be treated in the workplace. Those are your Emmys there. Is that another Emmy down there? The uh, that's a local Emmy, yep. Where's the Harvard diplomas when I want to know? Let me tell you, people, which is what it's always so depressing when people I mean, the, I worked and had an executive producer who just loved Harvard so much. And, and she's like, I tried to get into Yale. And I'm like, oh my God, you gotta leave. You're 45 years old, let it go. Yeah, it's not, I mean, like, it doesn't matter. It literally, and it, now my daughter's yeah. applying colleges and, and I have to keep telling her like, N I know this is gonna sound crazy. No one will give a fuck what your ACT score was. Literally, like very soon, no one will. And guess what? Once you get out of college, no one will ever ask you again what you got second semester Spanish class, ever. Like, no one gives a shit. You have to stop thinking of that. 